the Roman Empire had a long history of employing barbarian mercenaries. In the years of the Republican Empire, non-citizens were recruited from the borderlands to serve as auxilia. By the 4th century, barbarian contingents called Fuederati made up a huge part of the army, even the upper echelons. When the empire fell in the west, the Eastern Empire, posthumously called Byzantium, continued this long-standing tradition. In 578, the 15,000 strong Tiberiani consisted of various Germanic tribes in addition to Arabs, Berbers, Sudanese and Huns. However, these foreign armies were largely supplanted between the 7th and 8th centuries, the so-called Byzantine Dark Age, when large tracts of territory were lost to the Muslim Caliphate and migrating Slavs. The army faced a lack of discipline, and soldiers were only loyal to those that promised better pay and promotion. But in the 9th century, the empire struck back. The army was reorganized, and foreigners were sought once more to join its ranks, among them Slavs, Iranians, and Syrians. Some were employed as a private retinue for the emperor, most prominent being the Hitarie. It stems from the Greek word for comrade, Hetarios, and has largely been viewed as a continuation of the Foederati. They numbered somewhere around a thousand men and consisted of varying nationalities, Khazars, Turks, Maghrebs, but also native Greeks. In battle they served as both cavalry and infantry, and they had accompanied the emperor on parades, campaigns, and hunting trips. All of this to say that the Romans were always looking for warm, barbarian bodies to throw at the enemy. Byzantium had a rocky relationship with the nascent nation of Rus, situated in Eastern Europe. Constantinople itself had been attacked in 860, the raid likened to a thunderbolt. In 911, a treaty was signed, granting trade concessions to the Rus, and military assistance for the Byzantines. In the same year, 700 auxiliaries joined an expedition to Crete. In 941, a new treaty was signed, asking the Rus to defend Crimea from Bulgar incursions. Rus warriors partook in a second attack on Crete, fought the Arabs at the Battle of Hadath in 955, and then expedition to Italy in 968. The Byzantines were content with this deal, but not for long. In 988, the empire faced an armed uprising. A nephew of the late emperor, General Vardas Fokas, was marching on Constantinople to claim his birthright. The two brothers who ruled as co-emperors approached the Rus. If Knyas Vladimir would convert to Christianity, he could have the hand of the emperor's sister. Uh, for marriage, that is. It was a done deal. Vladimir was baptized, made a saint, the alliance struck, and to top it all off, Vladimir supplied his new allies with 6,000 troops. It was a great success. The emperor sicked his new attack dogs upon the upstart usurper. Several accounts provide different details on what happened next. In one story they met Vardas in good order. He made foul remarks on their appearance. In another account, the rebels were caught off guard when drinking. But they all agree on the vitals. Vardas did not survive. This was the beginning of the Varangian Guard. Historians have, and are still debating, the meaning and origin of the word Varangian. It appears first in the 11th century in several sources and languages, including the Greek Skelitsis Chronicle, the Arabic Book of Instruction, and the Old Slavonic Primary Chronicle. In both the Arab and Kievan sources, the term was used to denote Scandinavians. In older sources, the Byzantines and Arabs appear to have been largely unable to differentiate between Slavs, Finns, Balts and Scandinavians, and refer to any northern merchants and raiders as Rus, owing to their association with the Rus state, much how Vikings in the west were often called Danes, regardless of actual nationality. To the Greeks they were Varangi, to the Arabs Varangs, to the Slavs Varyagi, and to the Norse Varingi but we have no concrete evidence of where the term originated. Some have speculated that Varangian means one who travels, which makes sense, they did a lot of traveling. Another likely theory is that it is related to the Greek varagi, related to the word varvari, those who do not speak Greek, barbarians. The argument is that the Byzantines used Varangian in reference to any northern mercenaries, which isn't necessarily true. In an imperial crucible from 1060, Varangians and Rus are listed separately. In 1088, English, Germans, Rus, and Varangians. 
The most popular theory is that it stems from the Old Norse var, meaning oath. A Varangian would be someone who takes an oath. Indeed, the Varangians took many oaths. They served the Rus princes as diplomats, merchants, and mercenaries. And of course, they took oaths to serve the Greek emperor, who prized them highly for their supposed loyalty. Following a successful campaign in the Middle East, Emperor Basil made regular use of the Northmen in his army. According to one Byzantine writer, Basil knew the treacherous disposition of his countrymen. Thus, he lay his life in Varangian hands. They were to serve him and subsequent emperors as the royal bodyguard. By the time of the Comnenian dynasty, in the mid to late 11th century, they were organized into a proper regiment. Anna Komnenos would later write how they regarded their loyalty to the emperors and their protection of the imperial persons as a pledge and ancestral tradition, handed down from father to son, which they keep inviolate, and will certainly not listen to even the slightest word of treachery. This unquestioning loyalty can, of course, be questioned. Future king of Norway, Harald Hardrada, served as an officer in the guard between 1033 and 1042. During his service he misappropriated imperial taxes, kidnapped the emperor's niece, and cut out the emperor's eyes. In 1079, a band of Orangians got drunk on duty and attacked the emperor. When Constantinople was besieged in 1204, they only agreed to fight for the emperor at an incredibly steep price. It's not like their salary was poor in the first place. It was much higher than regular mercenaries who already made more than regular troops, in addition to special gratuities and the spoils of war. If the sagas are to be believed, when a new emperor was crowned, the guard would participate in a sort of ritual plundering of his private chambers. The guard was even founded on greed. You might have questioned why Vladimir was so eager to part with a whooping 6,000 warriors. Well, he had called them in during a civil war, and when the war ended and he couldn't pay them anymore, they got uppity and flat out asked him to be sent to the Greeks. Emperor Michael had Harald thrown in jail, enraging the guard and sealing his fate. He consigned Dowager Empress Zoe to a monastery on false charges of treason and tried to have the patriarch killed. The latter managed to rally the Varangians and overthrow the emperor. Zoe was reinstated and Harald set free. So in this incident, we find the Varangians partaking in a coup. When the emperor fled the city during the Fourth Crusade, the guard initially backed the puppet emperor, but shortly afterwards switched allegiance to the usurper, Alexios V. There are also instances of the Varangians backing rebel generals, but I digress. Harald was only ever a minor commander, in charge of 500 men. The leader of the guard was titled Akulatos, meaning acolyte or follower, referring to his constant proximity to the emperor. Most of them were of Scandinavian origin. We know the names of a few. In 1082, the guard was led by a mysterious Namfites, believed to be a Scandinavian appellation, such as Nabitur, corpse biter. A Swedish runestone also speaks of a Varangian commander, named Ragnvald. Recruitment into the guard was sporadic. The treaty signed between Rus and Byzantium in 911 declared, at whatsoever they might come, and whatsoever their number, to enlist in the imperial army. Sometimes, Individual parties would travel south, maybe accompanying a merchant boat. Some Scandinavian kings bound on a pilgrimage might grant the emperor a few of his men, or even lose them. The emperor usually paid better. The ethnic composition is also worth discussing. The initial nucleus of the guard was formed by Rus and the Norse mercenaries, most likely from Sweden and Gotland. Very soon, the ranks were joined by Norwegians, Danes, and even Icelanders. An army sent from Italy in 1009 consisted of Dani, Rossi, and Gualani, the identity of the Gualani being debated, possibly Vlax or even Welsh. There are mentions of guardsmen being Celtic. In the latter half of the 11th century, the Norman conquest of England led to an exodus of Saxons joining the guard. In Dobrudja, situated between modern Bulgaria and Romania, the Saxons even established a short-lived settlement called Nova Anglia. They would even get the chance to get back at their Norman enemies, fighting them in Sicily at several points in the late 11th century. The Byzantines would sometimes hark back to Britain's time as a Roman province and imply an inherited fealty. 
in the final centuries of the empire, the guard would take on an increasingly English character, with the Scandinavian influence fading around the 13th, mostly as a result of the Russian trade route dying off. By 1272, they were referred to as Englindvaranki, sometimes abbreviated to Inglini. I definitely want to cover the English Varangians exclusively in the future, but I don't know when. The uniforms and equipment of the guardsmen changed throughout the fading days of the empire, but their silhouette would largely remain the same. Full kudos to their iconic Pelecus, two-handed axe. Indeed, they were often known as the barbarians with axes on their shoulders. Two-handed weaponry borne on the shoulders seems to be a palace guard tradition. They had previously been described as carrying heavy swords called romfaya in this fashion. The axes were incredibly long. This ivory carving shows the shaft as long as its wielder, and considering the legendary tallness of the Norsemen, it could have been up to six feet. The heads varied immensely. In this piece of Byzantine art, we find a vast variety, some with spearheads like halberds. A more traditional bearded axe was discovered in Bulgaria, richly inlaid. A second axe found at the same site had a different shape, but the Scandinavian decorative patterns remained visible and distinct. A good starting point when discussing their equipment are the actual bodies of the Varangians. As mentioned previously, they were recognized as tall and burly. We'd probably imagined them as blonde and bearded, but the ivory engraving shows a shaved Varangian, as is this guardsman from a mosaic. Others were depicted with dark hair and beards. Most of them were described as having blue eyes. Of special note are the customary tattoos. In the 10th century, Ahmad ibn Fadlan famously described Rus warriors tattooing themselves from the nails to the neck with figures and trees in dark green. This custom was adapted from the Turkic peoples of the steppes. The clothes of Romania must have been especially impressive to the guardsmen. Their native clothes were simple linen tunics dyed with natural colors, whereas the Greeks wore a vast variety of colorful cottons, silks, brocades and damask. These were often lined with extravagant decorations. The basic uniform consisted of a tunic falling little to above the knee, trousers, boots and a cloak. While on duty in the palace, they had often wear red tunics and a purple cloak to indicate their service in the imperial guard. For headgear, they either wore a coif called kukulion or white shawls. These were often padded so as to be worn under a helmet. Prior to the 14th century and the advent of full plate, the best armor could be found in Byzantium. The guardsmen were heavily armored. Some of them, officers especially, wore Byzantine suits of scale or lamellar. Some wore their native hauberks, mail shirts, and others fought lightly equipped like regular Byzantine infantry. Light armor included the bra, a leather harness, or the padded zuppa, a cotton and linen gambeson. Aside from the axe, the Varangians likewise used spears, javelins, swords, and the aforementioned romfaya. This was a two-handed, forward-curving blade, descended from the Dacian falx. It's a shame that it's rarely, if ever, depicted in their hands, because the blade has a rich history and is definitely one of my favorite weapons. Shields are a different topic. They used both circular shields popular in Scandinavia, small bucklers called geriskutaria, and from the 11th century onwards, kite shields. When fighting with a long axe, the shield was either laid aside or slung on the back. From the 13th century onwards, the guard appears to have favored a heater shield, then very popular in the rest of Europe. The shields were blazoned and decorated. Legend states that when Oleg attacked Constantinople in 907, he took his shield, upon which a riding warrior was represented, and nailed it to the gates of Galata. The symbol of the riding warrior was another Turkic, nomadic ideal adapted by the Rus and Varangians, much like the tattoos or title of Kagan. The ideal of the mounted warrior even appears in Viking Age Sweden. A Varangian described in the Icelandic sagas, Bolli Bolason, was described as wielding a red shield with a gilded inlay of a mounted warrior. Ravens appear especially prominent on Varangian shields, leading some to speculate that they were a distinctive symbol of the guard. In Norse mythology the raven was sacred, but the guardsmen used it well into Christian times. As important as their blazonings were the banners carried into battle. They inherited the standard of the old imperial guard, called the excubitores. Their standard bearers were called draknarie, as in, they still carried the dragon standard of the late Roman Empire. 
The Draco consisted of a hollow bronze sculpture of a dragon head, inserted with a silken windsock. It is unknown if the Varangians used it per se, but the Draco appears in use by the house calls of King Harold Godwinson, and similar standards do appear in the region. Companies within the guard flew triangular streamers dyed red or purple, called Banda. The Varangian Guard is likely the most famous element of the Byzantine army, and make a frequent appearance in popular media, video games especially. In these depictions they are most often seen fulfilling a role on the battlefield, and little more. The Guard had their baptism by fire during the revolt of Vardas, after which they joined the Emperor on campaigns in the Middle East and Anatolia. For the remainder of their existence, the Guard would be deployed in battle against any threats to the Empire, internal and external alike. In 988, 1009 and 1041, they fought against rebellious noblemen. In the 11th century alone they fought Bulgars, Italians, Normans, Georgians, Turks, Serbs, Pechenegs and many more, in both defensive and offensive campaigns. The guard's primary battlefield duty was to protect the Emperor. At the Battle of Diracium in 1081, two columns of Varangians shielded the center commanded by the Emperor himself. At the Battle of Drastar they formed a reserve, designed to defend the Imperial baggage train. Indeed, the Emperor might be reluctant to risk their lives. At the Battle of Eskisagra in 1122, Frankish, Flemish and Byzantine units alike failed to take the defensive circle of Pecheneg wagons. The Emperor finally sent in the Guardsmen. In spite of facing odds as great as 60 to 1, the Guardsmen broke through the lager and committed great slaughter upon the Pechenegs. Their aggressiveness would sometimes prove their downfall. At the Battle of Diracium in 1081, initial success against the Norman cavalry led the guard into a foolish advance. They were separated from the main army, ambushed and butchered. A few of them escaped into a church. They defended it bravely, but the Normans set fire to the church. Some of the guardsmen suffocated, were crushed by falling debris, burned alive. Others sallied out to fight the Normans and died one by one. I previously mentioned Varangian greed, and the Emperor played into their lust for gold by offering them the privilege of being the first to plunder a conquered city. There are several accounts of their cruelty and depredations. During the capture of Emesa in 999, they set fire to the monastery of Saint Constantine to compel the retreat of its defenders. The Emperor might use this lust for carnage to his advantage. During Basil II's second campaign into Georgia, he ordered his Rus mercenaries to lay waste to the countryside. Detachments of Varangians were frequently dispersed across the empire to perform various duties on and off the battlefield. They'd serve in garrisons, protecting places like Duratium, Macedonia and Crete. It is not certain if they were permanent garrisons or sent to the region to perform a temporary assignment. Being seafarers at their core, Many Varangians were assigned to naval service. They embarked on light vessels called Uisii, and primarily employed for suppressing piracy. For every pirate vessel they captured, they had to pay the emperor 100 marks, but could keep the ship, loot, and prisoners. They also partook in regular naval forces. The guard would maintain a presence on the battlefield until the late 13th century. In 1272, they were besieged by the Bulgarians in the small town of Ainos. The Bulgarians offered to lift the siege in return for an important prisoner. The Varangians agreed. The next day, a relief force arrived. Whoops. The Emperor was so enraged that he had them flogged, dressed in women's clothes, and paraded on donkeys around the streets of Byzantium. From then on, the guard lost their prestige and maintained only their duty as a palace guard. Ever since their inception, the guard performed as imperial escort. Naturally, they'd followed their master into the great city itself. They'd marched the corpse and defeated army of Georgios Maniakes through its streets, and their emperor on similar parades, triumphs and holidays. One of the most important processions was the emperor's walk to the Hagia Sophia for attending mass. Luckily, the palace was located right next to the church, so they didn't have to walk very far. After returning home, the Rangian guards were assigned to imperial properties. They guarded the bronze doors of the great palace, his office, and reception chambers. Most impressive was the throne room. It housed robotic wonders like a throne that could rise and sink, 
mechanical roaring lions, and a bronze tree with artificial, singing birds. They'd certainly be impressive to the barbarian guardsmen, at least the first three or four times. They also served as a police force, and were especially disliked as alien enforcers of imperial policies and commands. Their ignorance of the local culture and language made them immune to popular sympathies, and perfect for performing delicate tasks like arresting popular figures. They were used as effective jailers and often torturers. One of their prisoners wrote the following poem. Hades I called the Numera, and even worse than Hades, and the shouting Varangi and terror keep you awake. After a long day of guarding the imperial outhouse, torturing political prisoners and misappropriating taxes, Varangians spent most of their time drinking. Byzantine sources refer to them as the Emperor's wine bags. This led to a few interesting altercations. Drunken guardsmen attacked both Emperors Michael VII and Nikephoros III. At one point they all got struck by some unknown malady, and the cure was simply to drink less wine, diluted with water. The regiment was too large to inhabit a single barrack, and were housed across the entire city. They even had their own churches. It is true that the Norse countries had become Christian by the 11th century, but the emperor's own guard were likewise obliged to show some piety, at least for the sake of propaganda. One of their own churches was called the Panagia Varangtiotissa, our sacred lady of the Varangians. It was dedicated to the mother of God and Saint Olaf, a Norwegian himself, and according to legend, his sword hung above the altar. They would attend the emperor and empress in the Hagia Sophia, and two possible guardsmen carved their runes into its marble. One of the inscriptions says, Halfdan was here, which is actually my middle name. The other simply says, Are, a popular name. Outside of the churchly domain, the guards took on several Byzantine pleasures, like chariot races and hippodrome spectacles. The emperor offered King Sigurdfur of Norway a choice between half a ton of gold or to have horse races held in his honor. He chose the latter. Which one would you have chosen? Some may have been involved in the fights between the four factions of circus supporters. These were akin to modern football hooligans. Aside from sports, they enjoyed brothels and the local women. But the feeling wasn't always reciprocated, and some weren't able to take no for an answer. Probably because most of them didn't speak Greek. Anyway, in one notable instance, one of these rapists was killed by the victim in self-defense. She took his sword and stabbed him through his heart. When the deed became known in the surrounding area, the Varangians held an assembly and crowned the woman, presenting her with all the possessions of her assailant. His body was thrown aside and left unburied, according to the law concerning suicides. Aside from being an interesting look into the Varangian legislation and perspective on honor, it also shows that they often dealt with their own problems in their own fashion. Service in the Varangian Guard had a huge impact back home. Legends are plentiful of seasoned veterans returning home with great treasure, wearing extravagant clothes, perhaps accompanied by a foreign wife, and certainly eager to implement the customs and systems they had learned from a much higher civilization. Veterans are especially commemorated in runestones. A Varangian might raise it himself using his own riches, or a relative might erect one in his memory, especially if he had fallen. A runestone from Gotland commemorates Rudfoss, who fell in battle against the Blackumen, believed to be Valachians. Their deeds were remembered in skaldic poetry, some of which was recorded in the 13th century. One reads as follows. Meiter Hilmir Samalma, Mikla Garfurs Fyr Barthi, Morg Skrithu Beitat Borjar, Barn Fuger Hume Army. The glorious monarchs of Mel roofed Constantinople, before the bow, many rimfair ships advanced towards the tall ramparts of the city. The treasures they amassed from their salary, bonuses, plunder and extortion, were legendary. They are mentioned in several written sources. This runestone mentions how Kar acquired many riches for his heir. Wealth was also carried in the form of clothing. No description is more illustrative than that of Bolli Bolason on his return to Iceland. He was dressed in a silken suit bestowed upon him by the emperor in Mitlagarfur. Over that he wore a scarlet cloak. At his belt he carried a sword footbeat, footbiter the hilt of which was adorned with gold, and a grip woven with golden thread. He wore a gilded helmet on his head, and had by his side a red shield with the gilded inlay of a knight. In his hand he held a dagger, as is the custom in foreign lands, 
and wherever he stayed for the night, the women could not resist staring at the grandeur surrounding Bolly and his followers. Bolly would probably have had no issue taking one of those women with him on his horse, but some may have brought home wives from the south. I have not encountered any written description of such events, but a genetic study from 2019 discovered a large influx of southern European DNA into Scandinavia during the Viking Age, especially in Denmark, but also scattered throughout Norway and a bit on Gotland. Perhaps a few of them were brought in by veteran guardsmen. Contact with Byzantium also had a notable influence on the religious aesthetics of Scandinavia. Churches decorated in the Byzantine manner can be found in places like Gotland and Denmark, from which we have the Dogmar crucifix, very reminiscent of the Roman design. We don't know if any Norsemen converted to Orthodox Christendom per se. Many of them did not seem to be aware of the schism, and were already quite syncretic with their practices. There is also the matter of political effects. During the 10th and 11th centuries, the Scandinavian countries saw a process of centralization, which may have been inspired by contact with Byzantium, which was then the most well-organized country in Europe. The best example lies in Norway and Harald Hardrada. Using his experiences, veteran warriors and considerable fortune, he imposed his hard rule over the country. One of the most prominent effects was in coinage. Compared to earlier monarchs, Harald increased the scope of monetization and issued new designs. Both Harald and his contemporary in Denmark, Sven Ulfsson, used debased currency. This was uncommon in contemporary Europe, with the exception of Byzantium. This is believed to be an indication of both Harald and Sven imitating the more centralized Roman administration. The Varangian Guard would see a continual decline in the 13th century. Part of the reason was the closing off of the trade route through Russia, owing to several factors discussed in one of my previous videos. The tumult caused by the fall of Constantinople is also to blame. The guard took on an increasingly and possibly exclusively English character. Many often began to integrate with the local Romans and there was an increasing documentation of Varangupoli, people of mixed Varangian descent. In 1402, a letter from the emperor to the king of England mentions English warriors defending the city against the Turks. Two years later, we get our final mention of axe-bearing soldiers of British race defending Byzantine envoys to Rome. Perhaps they partook in the fall of Constantinople in 1453. Who knows? Northern mercenaries and the Varangian Guard had a long and epic history, and I was just unable to recount all of their adventures. So, I find it apt to conclude with a timeline of their major exploits. 988. Vladimir of Kiev sends 6,000 men to aid Basil II against the rebellion of Vardas Fokas. Between 994 and 1001, Rus partake in Basil's campaign in Syria, Georgia, and Armenia. Between 1001 and 1018, they join his campaigns against Bulgaria. 1009, they are sent against rebels in southern Italy and recapture the city of Bari. 1018, the Rus partake in the Battle of Canae, claiming victory over the rebels and their Norman mercenaries. 1033, the Rangians partake in an expedition to Egypt. 1034 to 1043, Harald Hardrada serves in the Varangian Guard. 1041. The Varangians fight the Normans at the Battle of Monte Maggiore. 1071. The Battle of Manzikert. The Varangians defeated. The Emperor captured by the Turks. 1081. The Varangians defend Constantinople against Alexios Komnenos, soon to be the new Emperor. Danish and Anglo-Saxon Varangians get a chance to square off against the Normans, but are defeated at Duratium. 1122. English Varangians make a decisive attack on the Pechenegg wagon fort at Eski Zagra. 1149. Varangian garrisons defend Thebes against the Normans. 1154. 300 Varangians help in stopping an assassination attempt on the Emperor's life. 1155. The Varangians defeat a Norman invasion of Cyprus. 1176. Most of the Varangians are wiped out by the Turks at the disastrous Battle of Mediokephalon. But in 1179, they partake in the victory at Cladiopolis. 1203. The Varangians are defeated by the Crusaders in the failed defense of Constantinople. Between 1205 and 1261, they serve the exiled Nicaean Empire and the despotate of Epirus. 1261. The Palaeologos dynasty reconquers Constantinople and restore the empire. 1265. The Varangians defend the city of Aenos against the Bulgarians, but after surrendering the former Turkish Sultan, 
are disgraced by the emperor. 1341, Cantacuzeno selects 500 men as imperial bodyguards, adding them to the axe-bearing Varangians, as many as there were in service. 1351, the guard are mentioned as participating in imperial ceremonies. 1404, axe-bearing guardsmen accompany a Byzantine envoy to Rome. And finally, in 1453, Constantinople is conquered by the Ottoman Turks.